Greetings to everyone. I am so delighted and excited to be able to introduce our guest artist today. Thrilling audiences with more than 200 performances each season, the Met Orchestra is one of the world's great performing ensembles, both on stage and in the opera pet. Since its founding in 1883, the Met Orchestra's performances have encompassed not only the entire opera repertoire, but symphonic and chamber programs at Carnegie Hall, international tours, and countless musician activities outside of the Metropolitan Opera House. The Met Orchestra has grown in the past four decades into an ensemble noted by singers, critics, conductors, and audiences as one of today's most stylistically versatile and musically satisfying orchestras. So on behalf of Concerts from the Library of Congress, I am delighted to present to you today six musicians who are joining us today to share with us their insights and perspectives on their upcoming program. We have, uh, we have here today uh, um, uh, our two principal oboes from the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, Elaine Duvas and Nathan Hughes. Uh, we have the principal horn of the Met Orchestra, Eric Rowski, Dean LeBlanc, who is um, second clarinet and bass clarinet, and then finally, we have Mark Romatz, um, who is second bassoon and contra bassoon. And we have once again, Julia Bruskin, who is a member of the cello section of the Met Orchestra. So thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so before we talk about the program you will be performing, I would like to discuss some of the activities your organization and 501c3 has been involved in. Uh, could you tell our listeners a, a little bit about how Met Orchestra Musicians was founded and a bit about the history of it? Sure. Um, well, we are so delighted to be here today. Thank you, Kazim and, and Anne and everyone at the Library of Congress for presenting the Met Orchestra Musicians. Um, during this pandemic um, and this long closure of the Met, we've been thrilled to be able to, as an orchestra, um, independently form our own organization, the Met Orchestra Musicians Fund. Um, and this is a 501c3 that has allowed us to um, spotlight our in, the individuals who make up the Met Orchestra through programming, to stay connected with our audiences through all kinds of different performances, outdoor performances, pop-ups, educational outreach and programming, as well as um, something we call the Met Orchestra Spotlight Series, which is a recorded virtual series that we've put on all year um, with chamber music performances of our players um, through our own, our own platform on our website, metorchestramusicians.org. Um, but we also are fundraising on behalf of our members. Our, our fund has given out two rounds of grants now to um, over their eligible. Um, we have over 150 members of our orchestra, associate musicians, librarians, and music staff who are eligible to apply for our grants. And um, it's really been an amazing thing to see our orchestra band together and, um, and work on behalf of all of our members. Um, and so this has been an exciting thing to be able to do. Um, also just an immense pleasure to be able to perform again in some of these ways. And we're, we're so grateful to be part of this season of the concerts at the Library of Congress. Thank you for including us. No, well, you're very welcome. And um, yeah, like I, 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 I'll speak, I mean, I'll speak for myself, but probably also for Anne. Um, we both watched the video and it was just such a, I mean, it was such a joy and a pleasure to hear the grand partita and the like, arrangement of the, um, um, of the selections from Don Giovanni and of course the summer music. And it was just such a really wonderfully well-made video, uh, so musical um, with just wonderful overtones and like the Mozart, it was just really splendid. So like, I think our listeners will, uh, will really enjoy the video very much. Um, yeah, these are so, really our superstars performing in this program today. We're so glad to have so many of our no, I would, wonderful players to present yeah, today. No, I would, no, yeah, no, yeah, I would say superstars for sure is really just such an just so uh, just so well played. And so I just kind of wanted to just segue into sort of the first piece and. Yeah, you, you know, the, the, the harmony music trends of making wind ensemble arrangements of operas and symphonies in earlier centuries were sort of so necessary to classical music and to opera. And, um, and what I love about this program in particular is that you programmed um, and opened the concert with this wonderful arrangement of selections of Don, Gio of Don Giovanni by Tribenze. And I saw on the Met Musicians website that you have really been trying to make opera and operatic theme music accessible in the pandemic. For example, um, with your arrangements of selections from from from, uh, from operas such as uh, the Grand March from Tannhäuser uh, th th that was arranged for brass ensemble, or the arrangement for for cellos from something from Lohengrin, or, or, 
or, or the, the duet of selections from the Magic Flute for uh, Flute and Cello Duo. And so like, I, I, I found that that's great that you're sort of finding this modern way of doing what Chibinze did 200 years ago. And so my first question for you about the uh, Don Giovanni arrangement is, since all of you have, have of course played Don Giovanni, do you find there is an element of parody in this arrangement? All the humor that's in the original is, is, is there. And then of course in miniature form, it becomes a little bit more comical in, in certain ways. And you have instruments taking over the lines of the singers. So, you know, that in a way has its own charm. And um, yeah, it's such great music. And, and um, just, you know, as, as formerly a symphonic uh, performer, exclusively since joining the Met, you, you've, you've always heard um, going back to student days about how Mozart was first and foremost a theater composer. And, um, you know, I've discovered playing these operas and getting to know them inside out uh, since I joined the Met Orchestra. It really some of the best Mozart really is in, in these operas. And uh, these these arrangements, transcriptions by Trebenze are, are just phenomenal. Um, and in fact, yeah, I mean, like you said, he's doing, he did 200 years ago, what we're kind of doing now is just to, to, and it's actually been done throughout the history of music. You know, you have all those um, piano arrangements of famous symphonies or forehand arrangements. And it's, it, you know, back before, I guess, uh, you know, recorded music and the internet and so on and so forth. This is a way of people to get to know um, and hear, maybe the only way to get to know and hear some of this music. So yeah, it, it seems fitting to, to go back to that, you know, since we can't do full operas, uh, fully staged operas with big audiences live, it's it's great to do these 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 miniatures. No, for sure. Um, and I'm curious for some of you, what kinds of things do you think are particularly effective in this arrangement? Are there any things that like you think look particularly make it great or look particularly make it appealing? Well, the bassoon takes over so much of the important stuff, and, and the bassoon being sort of a comical instrument has always been reputed to be the clown of the orchestra. The fact that, that the bassoon gets so much of Leporello's music in these transcriptions, it's, it's really seems so well suited. You know, it's brilliant, brilliant arranging. It must be fun for you, in a way, to become actors in real time. I mean, something you, you do all the time in the pit. And for us, it's so wonderful to see you, such superb musicians, um, on top and, and hearing you really perform this music as singers. It, it's just great to, to hear this. These octet arrangements serve the purpose that a record player serves today. People weren't able to hear the melodies unless they had some way to perform them at home or hear them in small groups. Uh, and I think the parody is really uh, in, in Mozart's original. Um, there's so much you could say about Don Juan and Don Giovanni. He's just been the most fascinating character to authors and composers throughout history. But um, the way Mozart blends comedy and tragedy in this opera is, is just astonishing. And the wind octet is really just sort of a, a direct transcription. And it's so fun for us to take the vocal roles and tell the story with our instruments. Yeah, I also think it's nice that taking the vocal roles and putting them into a wind an ensemble of wind players because we're still able to, still able to keep that connection with the voice and the and the wind instruments is a really nice thing. Nothing against the strings, but <laughs> but it is nice to translate that into another uh, I guess instrument per se. You know that uses wind and air, so it's a good translation. And also the wind octet itself, it's, it's like a miniature orchestra. You know, you have the oboes carrying the, the violin lines and the um, uh, clarinets too and the upper strings. And you have the bassoons carrying everything from, you know, cellos and double basses and the horns also providing the harmony. Um, of course, the treatment say arrangement is done at a time when the horn, uh, speaking as a horn player, it was a, a natural horn, valveless instrument, right? And so, you know, it's limited to 16 pitches, essentially. And, and so the, the horn parts actually remain fairly true to, to, to Mozart's in many ways, um, um, because it was the horn of Mozart's day. I hope you're not saying you could make do without us, Eric. All of us <laughs> strings. No, 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 we're essential. We're essential. <laughs> they put all the hard violin parts in the second clarinet part. So <laughs> I'm happy to give those parts back to you. <laughs> and don't you find that it's inspirational to sort of 
try to sing the same parts that we're so used to hearing. You know, you sing through your instrument these uh, these wonderful lines that we hear on stage, and to try to do that with your instrument is, I think, it's a challenge because singers have so much range with their voice uh, that I think for us to strive for that is a really great challenge. I don't know if the rest of you feel that when you play things like this. Yeah. And yet who better to do it than all of you who've had that in your ears for so many years and heard the very best voices sing these things. I think it's it's amazing to have that channeled through this, this group. And the, the fun thing for me was that I think I, I, if I'm recalling, we did four movements. I think only one of the movements actually has clarinet in it in the opera. So I got to play three movements that I always just hear if I'm just sitting there in the pit waiting to play my number that comes up. And so I was like, oh, wow, I actually get to play this music for once, you know, which I never, you know, never normally get to do. So it was fun. You know, I was thinking about the barber in the context of how players influence and drive composition and thinking about... Um, the story behind this one, which I read in your, your annotator's great notes, and I was going to say to the audience that the, uh, the writer, your annotator, is a member of the Met musical staff, right? He's one of your assistant conductors, David Jackson. These are just fantastic notes, but um, he tells this, a little bit of the story, the backstory of the barber, which was originally conceived for, I think, three strings, three woodwinds, and piano or something like that. But what I was interested in is how Barber decided uh, to work with the New York Woodland Quintet, and he would attend many of their rehearsals and learned a lot about woodland techniques, which is really interesting to hear. And a side note is I was thinking about how, again, players really grow the repertoire. I'm thinking about what you were saying about the instrumentalists in, in this time they were often traveling people like natural horn players who traveled from city to city um, and so on. So in this case, the Barber Quintet, first I, I'd love to hear from you, how do you feel that, what is it about this piece that makes it such a classic for woodwind quintets? It's always cited as the great piece. And we could talk about the characters, but what for you as players makes it this? I'll just jump in and say, um, I've always felt it's like really the masterpiece of the wooden quintet repertoire. Um, it's such an iconic, you know, Ameri Southern American flavor that comes out of this music. I mean, it's, it's like reading a Faulkner novel or something. And it's, it's captures really the essence of, of, of what one thinks of about the South and, and, uh, you know, particularly maybe about the time in which the piece was written, but it's just, that summer lazy hot you can feel the humidity just listening to the piece um as well as the, it's just you know such a great piece of like an american impressionism in, in a way of just it gives you know uh, it's not programmatic per se but it it, it just captures uh like a like, like a film score maybe it's just uh, images that that come to mind as you hear it of um you know bugs and flying and in June humid humid air and you know the lazy energy as well as then you know it certainly stirs up and and the piece just takes off and and, and reaches just a flurry of, of virtuosic uh writing and um as, as the piece comes to a climax and it's you just see so easily get get swept away with it um, um yeah he obviously uh, barber um given the fact that he hadn't written any chamber music for uh, wind instruments up to this time. This is, I think, the only piece he writes for, for, for wind instruments uh, in the chamber, chamber music genre. Uh, you know, he really obviously studied and got to know, know what, uh, what special colors, what kind of textures uh, each instrument could bring. Um, and, and I think that's what makes it such a, a magnificent score for Wooden Quintet, because he captures, I think, just about everything that a Wooden Quintet can do, just in, in expressive gestures. Um, the blend, as well as the, um, actually the five distinct colors uh, of the five different instruments. Um, as a horn player, I would just say, you know, so you play in a brass quintet, and, and it's, it's that hom homogeneous sound, you know, we're all brass instruments. On a wooden quintet, you've got, you know, um, five very different instruments. Um, you actually have four different um, 
uh, methods of tone production. You've got the double reeds of the oboe and the bassoon, you have the single reed instrument, the clarinet, you got a flute with no reed, and you got a brass instrument, uh, the French horn. And so these are five different colors that I think, you know, Barber, he just don't seem to know what color to reach for at any given moment and, and make the most out of it. So, um, you know, I just love the piece and um, so glad we got to do this. It was just just a great experience to to reunite and, and, and to play the piece. About the colors, um, your your notes say that the uh, the modes use four different modes to enable the players to get different colors within a certain section. That was interesting to me. And the laziness aspect, I read that he uh, talked about it should be languid, and but not like you're killing mosquitoes. That's actually a, his quote. But the markings, in terms of the laziness, he he talks of, he actually marks something indolent, I believe, in this. And it made me the piece makes me think of the James A. G. Knoxville summer of 1915. It's interesting you mentioned Faulkner. That that's very interesting to me. What any other thoughts about the the writing from anyone else? Well, I think most woodwind players agree that this is our greatest woodwind quintet and for me it's the emotional quality of it that makes it absolutely unique and although there isn't anything programmatic except for the title um it is so emotionally charged and it's really only the beginning that's lazy and indolent there is so much intense emotion in this piece i think it would be impossible for anybody to hear it and not imagine a scenario um, I mean, it's really for the listeners to imagine their own, for the performers to imagine their own, or he would have specified something. But when he puts something like exultant, ecstatic in the um, sort of swirling love scene, may I call it, where the, uh, the flute and the clarinet are playing these amazing, brilliant runs that sound absolutely symphonic. Uh, it's hard to think of anybody else writing such a thing for Woodwind Quintet. It sounds absolutely symphonic, and one is swept away, whether playing it or hearing it. It's just monumental. I mean, and I would just add, too, he writes so beautifully for your instrumental name, you know, for oboe. I mean, he has such a gift for melody, and, um, you know, some of the, 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 the low-energy stuff in the beginning, the, you get this really beautiful just sort of plaintive oboe solos and I, I can't help but think about the um, Barbara Violin Concerto and the slow moment it just has an, uh, an iconic oboe solo it's just uh, it's been used in movies and it's uh, it's just about one of the most stirring things so he had a real ear I think for also the oboe color and and and, and melody for oboe particularly but yeah there's a this there's a bit of everything for everybody in this in this piece, and I think it's over all the stops for sure. Well, of course, it was Brahms who first famously gave the oboe the main tune in his violin concerto. <laughs> I'm sure it pains all the solo violinists to stand there and listen to the oboe present the melody before they get a chance. And then Barbara did the same thing, and to my astonishment. I found myself with the same role in the cello concerto by Barber. The oboe again presents a many lines of oboe solo as the exposition of this slow movement melody. It's yeah. so nice. You know, I, plaintive like, melodies are the specialty of the oboe, and most of the composers give us that role. Yeah, how lucky you guys are. Uh, I, I think about the. Um, Barbara Violin Concerto uh, oboe solo as being though, you know, so beautiful, but tinged with some real sorrow and sadness. And, and um, uh, I, I know, thinking back to 9-11, um, uh, I was in the Philharmonic at that, in those days, and uh, that theme was actually used. We, uh, we recorded some uh, soundtrack to to a 9-11 uh, memorial thing i think it was for hbo but but that was like the running theme throughout the show be, um, because it, it's just so moving and i don't i think when barbara writes these things for oboe there's nothing like it back to you okay great um 
So, so I guess we could maybe uh, now segue maybe um, onto the grand partita with the remaining time. Oh, um, uh, since that piece actually sort of takes up the most time on the program. Um, I'm curious for all of you, um, the Grand Partita is both of its time and timeless, I guess you could say. It's beloved in both pop culture, like through the movie Amadeus, and and there's been like, um, and I'm curious, um, what was your, maybe your first introduction to the work? Was it through that movie or was it, uh, or was it actually through a live performance? I, I'll speak to that. Uh, the first time I heard it, was when I was in college, I was at the University of Michigan uh, in the wind ensemble at the time and the conductor really emphasized listening to these recordings of the Netherlands wind ensemble. And they did a recording of this piece and it was the first time I heard it. And it was at the time, probably the best recording that I ever heard of any wind ensemble. And it just, it blows your mind, especially back then as an, an impressionable young musician. and. Uh, all the recordings of theirs were huge influences on generations of wind players. And that would, but that would have been the first time I heard it. And what then was I the recording mark? actually hearing it live for many years, actually. What was the recording, Mark? Sorry, I didn't. The Netherlands Wind Ensemble. Oh, Netherlands, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Rich yeah, I... sound, incredible sound. Yeah. I think I the first recording I heard was it might have been the Berlin Winds, I think. But I remember I was pretty young and I had no idea what I was listening to. <laughs> I just remember being like, oh my God, what is this? You know, this is incredible. I was very young and I had an older brother who's about 12 years older than me, and he used to go to the public library and take records and put all kinds of classical music on tapes for me because he was a big classical music lover. He's not a musician. I mean, he plays guitar and stuff, but he was not, he's not a professional musician, but he would put all kinds of things on cassette tapes for me and then bring them to me. And I, so I got exposed to all kinds of music because of my brother just bringing me this stuff and handing it to me. And that was one of the things he put on there. And I just remember thinking, wow, this is, you know, I didn't know why I liked it. I didn't know how much of a genius Mozart was that he wrote this piece, but it's, you know, and now I think back that, I've been listening to this piece my whole life and didn't even realize I'd be playing it so much. <laughs> yeah. Well. yeah, but just going back to the, yeah, like, you know, just going back to oboe solos, I would probably say that opening oboe note at the beginning of the adagio, I mean, it's just, you know, it's literally just one note and if it's beautifully played, it can speak volume. So Nathan, I, I'm sure, yeah, you know, it must be a pleasure to play this work. Yeah, and I, I'm sure the first time I heard this work was in the movie Amadeus uh, when I was younger. I'm, I'm sure that's when I heard it, but it was before I even started playing the oboe. So I not only didn't know what piece it was, but I didn't have a connection to the oboe that I do, you know, today. So um, I, rem but I do distinctly remember that scene from the movie from the first time I saw it. And I think it must have been in college where I finally discovered the piece. I didn't get to play it until many years later, but just hearing it, I couldn't wait for the opportunity to play it. I'm just going to tell you a funny story about my first acquaintance with it. I was in high school and I auditioned for the band on the barge, Robert Austin Boudreaux, and they plumped the last movement down in front of me for sight reading. <laughs> so hard. I mean, you really have to practice that. Hats off to you, Nathan. You make it sound like a piece of cake, but that was hilarious. It's sight reading that as a high schooler. Wow. Wow. Very neat. Um, now, so, uh, uh, now, so Mozart's serenade lasts almost 50 minutes. Um, uh, and it's in seven movements. And of course, it depends on how many repeats you include, but it is certainly a work of incredible depth and grandeur. And yet it was written to entertain, actually. So how do you explain this format of music design to entertain, but with incredibly, I guess you could say, lofty ambitions in scope? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I'd be very curious to see what everybody thinks about that. But I think a lot of composers, perhaps from their perspective, it is more geared towards the lofty goals. I think perhaps, you know, whatever they, whatever the commission is, if it's for entertainment purposes, okay, fine. But I think in their mind, they're probably trying to write a great 
piece of, of art, I'm, I'm guessing most of the time uh, serious composers are doing that. Um, so I think the entertainment element of it was just where the interest was from the public, perhaps at that time for this kind of music and, you know, Mozart and others used the opportunity to write some great compositions. And I think maybe in this case, I think he wrote this one around the time that he was trying to make his mark in Vienna. Um, maybe just uh, just when he was moving to Vienna or he wrote it maybe before, but it was, I think, premiered um, when he was trying to get noticed. So, you know, maybe it was for a social event of some kind, perhaps, but that, you know, maybe it would catch somebody's ear that it was so remarkable and that might, you know, lead to other things, other commissions and other, um, yeah, projects that he might be able to do. So. That's that's my guess about that. Any of the others? Okay. Yeah, I was thinking uh, uh, sort of along the same lines, and I think the the only reason that it it sort of gets uh, locked into entertainment is because back then I think they were just trying to get their music played in any venue that they possibly could, and so you know it ended up being entertainment for a dinner party back then in a palace somewhere. That's what he did. But I mean, I, I agree with Nathan with that I think most composers go for the lofty goal. And uh, I mean, there are, there's a letter apparently that surfaced at one time by Mozart to his father when he talked about the writing of the piano quintet for piano and four winds that he thought it was the best thing he had written. At the time. So I don't, don't really think that he was looking, maybe just a way to uh, employ musicians. You know, he was a musician. <laughs> and, there, and in fact, the last time I played the Grand Partita, which is 2019 at the Sunflower Music Festival, it is such a long piece. We had to figure out some way to take rests. And so we had a narrator read some of Mozart's letters to his father. And at one point, we talk about how musicians aren't paid nearly enough for what they do. So. <laughs> It's an ongoing theme through it's history. An ongoing yeah. theme. <laughs> oh. Mozart was the first union rep. He didn't even right. know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I think commissions um, are a strange thing. I, I, I don't know. I shouldn't say I think they are. I think they would be a strange thing for composers because there's all of a sudden this pressure put on them to write something and, and like, you know, and it would depend on the scene. Oh, I would, we want this to be entertainment. So all of a sudden, Oh, do I have to write a piece that sounds like entertainment or I, you know, or you're being commissioned by an opera company or by this, like, I, I think it would be a, a very, I think it could be a difficult position for a composer to be in, but I don't know. Mozart, eh, who knows? He seemed from all accounts seemed to be a mis mischievous guy and probably took it as a challenge to, to put his aspirations into the piece and to do any, there's some really fun, really jovial movements and, you know, mischievous kind of movements in that, in the Grand Partita. So for him, I'm sure he just looked at it as a challenge to do both things. And, you know, I mean, he's such a genius. So, but yeah, I, I think it's a strange position for a composer, that pressure, yeah. that, oh, I've got to write this for this, for this occasion, and it's got to be this. And uh, that's hard. That's a hard thing to do, you know? That's true. Speaking of paying composers for their work, one could tell an interesting story about the Barber summer music that in lieu of a paid commission, Barber decided to ask for donations from the audience, and it was guaranteed that he would get the first $2,000 of donation from the audience. And uh, the audience, therefore, felt very invested in the success of the piece. <laughs> wow. Oh, it's a very good model, actually. It's a very good model to, to try today. Um, going back to the Mozart, yeah, like especially for Dean, yeah, like, you know, Mozart, he got to know Anton Stadler, the famous clarinetist um, for whom he wrote the uh, clarinet quintet and the concerto and for so many other pieces. Um, and yeah, you know, he also kind of discovered Stadler's instrument, the basset horn, which you're playing on in the Grand Partita. And so um, it's clear to me that this meeting between Stadler and Mozart conspired to produce an explosion of ideas. And I'm curious, do you think that the use of basset horns is Mozart wanting to experiment a little more in terms of sonority? 
Well, it's interesting because he puts both clarinets and basset horns in this piece. So he puts both, I mean, he clearly loved the clarinet. And then, I mean, interesting thing, there's, there's actually the clarinet, there's a basset clarinet and then the basset horn. The basset clarinet is an extension of the regular clarinet with just a lower range. So it uses the same bore and the same mouthpiece, but the basset horn is a bigger bore, has a different quality than the basset clarinet. So there's actually two categories of basset. Um, like in, in Clemenza de Tito, the opera, there's, there's one movement that has a big basset clarinet solo and then another movement that has a basset horn solo, um, which basset horn is a fourth lower. Um, it has a more mellow kind of, uh, you know, um, language. That seems to be the word of the day. <laughs> language tone. Um, so, but I think it's great that he put both two clarinets, regular clarinets, and then two basset horns. He also uses the basset horns in the, the Requiem, um, which I think was absolutely intentional because it's a Requiem and, and it has that kind of sonority, that kind of, it can be a kind of a melancholy sounding instrument. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he just, I, I think he was just experimenting with everything, but I think using in the Grand Partita was definitely strategic. It was because he wanted to have both sets of clarinets and really distinguish different melodies and different um, sonorities, you know, within that piece and be able to like, you know, have a full range of the clarinet. Um, there was no bass clarinet at the time, so, you know. That, Do you, uh, you go back and forth seamlessly and make it look very easy, but for the player, are there challenges to switching between those instruments or? Oh, it's like completely different instrument. It's a totally different, it's a different animal. <laughs> Basset horn is, is uh, <laughs> unwieldy and <laughs> doesn't want to cooperate and <laughs> is a challenge at every moment. <laughs> but it's, it's really fun. In a way, it's almost liberating to have that because it's just so different than the clarinet that you you um you have to be in a completely different frame of mind when you play it everything how you produce the sound and the whole everything about it is just it's just totally different so um but it is a really unique sound um and i think it i you know i think it really adds a lot uh, strauss used it a lot too strauss in his operas there there's just straight basset horn parts in some of his operas or doubling on bass clarinet um, very soloistic parts too. Um, and I thought it was, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting that Strauss really, really took on the basset horn as a major solo instrument in the orchestra. <clears throat> and I always wondered if that was influenced by Mozart, you know. <clears throat> Strauss also used it a lot in his chamber uh, orchestra or chamber pieces, I should say. The, sultine, the suite, I think, maybe not the suite so much, but the larger ones, the um, happy invalids workshop and the happy workshop or something. I think there are best ones in all of those. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely diff it's it's an interesting instrument and and um, you know, it still has an upper range, but just the lower range is such a great sound and you know, very interesting. But yeah, Stadler was a they were very good friends. Um, and, you know, when you look at, I think they met in like 1773 or something. And when you look after 1773, all of the clarinet works that exploded out of that friendship and that collaboration, um, uh, you know, he, he, they, they were not only did, I, I think not only did they like him as a, like him as a performer, but they were, like I said, close friends and, and apparently Stadler borrowed lots of money from Mozart, which he never repaid. <laughs> So Mozart must have really liked him. And, and I think Stadler also joined the Freemasons. And so, um, yeah, it was, I, I, from what I understand and what I've read about their relationship is Stadler, Mozart actually was very influenced, his composition was very influenced by Stadler's ability to play and what he could do on the instrument and started crafting his music almost to fit um, Stadler's technique and ability and stuff, which at the time was, was, I think was pretty phenomenal considering there was not very many keys on the clarinet and with accidentals and stuff, it was a lot of strange fingerings to make those uh, uh, different half steps come out without the keys. So he had to be a pretty phenomenal player to be able to play this stuff, the concerto and all of it. So, you know, 
great, great music though. It really underlines what we were talking about earlier about how musicians help to create the repertoire. Um, Schottler for sure, and then apparently there were traveling basset horn players, the Springer brothers, who were the first people to bring basset horns into the court structure there in Vienna. I didn't realize until looking at your program that oboes were preferred more in Germany and clarinets a little less so until the time you're talking about, 1773. But um, these basset horns, I, now I understand from your comments why your annotator says that basset horn can be cantankerous. I didn't understand that before. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it fights you all the way. <laughs> good fight, though. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, you have to fight the good fight for Mozart. Right. <laughs> right? You just you keep doing it. Push forward. <laughs> Do you agree with ETF Hoffman's description of the sound as like the scent of a red carnation? As a thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I never thought of the sound as having a scent to it. Yeah, I'd like to actually talk about uh, one other one other characteristic of Mozart's serenade, and, um, and and it's the fact that it contains actually, you know, not just one minuet, but two two minuets and four trios, which is actually very unique. Actually, I think, and. Uh, these four trios, they range from, from a kind of a minor key elegy to a Lindler. And I'm curious uh, for uh, uh, those of you that played it, in your view, what importance does folk music have in classical music? And do you sort of feel that our affinity with this element could be lost throughout time as we get further and further away from Mozart's time? That's a that's a big question. I think it's it's hard to answer that. I think in the Grand Partita, him putting in two sets of minuets with double trios. Um, I my guess is that he was just going big. He was just going big in every way possible. He was going to have two minuets and two sets of trios. He was going to have two adagio movements. He was going to have. 13 players instead of the normal six or eight. It was going to be an hour long instead of 20 or 30 minutes long. He was going to experiment with the Bassett horn because this new invention had only been around for a while. So I think he was just going big with this piece. So, um, and of course it had been very common for minuet and trios to be in many of these serenades, many of the symphonies. This was a normal uh, compositional technique. Um, but the big question you're asking is whether or not we're sort of losing that a little bit in classical music is, is a tough question. I think, I guess if you think of folk music as relevance to what's going on at the time or something music like that, yeah. I mean, I can think of um, examples of current composers who do try to include some sort of modern day element into their music. And maybe it's not exactly a folk tune or, a, you know, something we we might hear, you know, in, in the pop realm or something like that. But they do other things. I was I was just thinking of this piece um, by Todd Macover. He um, he wrote a piece for the Philadelphia Orchestra called Philadelphia Voices. And he's actually been composing. I think he's been getting commissions by many cities to write a piece that sort of shows characteristics from that city in the piece. And in this particular piece, um, there's there's one portion in the piece where he actually has the sounds of a Philly cheesesteak being made in the piece. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was funny. I, I played this in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Orchestra where, of course, you know, they all are, were very, very into that. It was really funny. But then we took it on tour and did it at Carnegie. And it was the audience still had a reaction, but not quite as much as the people that are from that town. And I think, anyway, I do think it's still going on today. Composers are still trying to um, stay relevant and you know connected with our modern day ears and opinions and everything. So um, it, it probably just takes a slightly different form now. Would be my 
my yeah. take on it. But I think I still think that composers, they're still part of society like everybody else, you know, and are aware of everything that's going on and are, um, you know, sometimes putting these things in there, sometimes in a way that's very overt. So everybody knows what they're doing. And sometimes they just hide things, you know, and they just sprinkle them in there without other people knowing. I think to, to my, I mean, as I see it, composers are always writing from what they know, from what they experience, and that could be something like a Philly cheesesteak, but also as we were discussing before, it's the performers they know, the music they're hearing. I think there's there's certainly no way to separate that from the creative process. And in, in, with some composers, you, you're able to kind of pick out the influences more more clearly, and with others, it's just kind of part of part of their voice as it evolves. But I, I, I think it would be hard to imagine a composer who wasn't influenced by by the world they live in and the the voices around them. Yeah, I don't I mean, how do we even is there even what we call folk music anymore? I mean, how do we even define what folk music is now? You know, I mean, there <clears throat> seems like pop music is more what folk we would call folk music now, but but everything is so global now. I mean, you can listen to every kind of music at any at the touch of a button, you know, and so you're not like bar talk going and finding you know some little village and hearing a little folk um tune being played that's that's specific to their small area in the world well now you can just go on and listen to that anywhere you want and every you know musicologists have documented it all and recorded all kinds of stuff and so it's like how do you even define folk music anymore it's 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 and like i think what um like Nathan was saying, Julie, like they're they're pulling just from whatever culture is in front of them at the moment, whatever music, whether it's pop or or whatever or whatever it's defined as, you know, and they will interject that into their music now. But yeah, I don't even know. Is folk music? Hmm. What is that now? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's like it, it seems like nothing separate anymore. You know, you can get anywhere and go on Google Earth and do a satellite image of a little yeah. village. And it's it's crazy how, how much we're so, you know, so everything's so accessible now. So I don't know. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think it's been going on for a long time. Even, I mean, Aaron Copeland in his Appalachian Spring used a, a shaker melody or whatever they, they call it. And, I've played chamber music by William Grant Still that was based on some folk tunes. In fact, I think it's called Folk Song Suite or something like that. Ray Vaughn Williams wrote the, his Folk Song Suite, actually. So. Yeah. It continues, I think. Yeah, it continues. I mean, but it seems to be based on older folk tunes. Like, I'm not sure, is folk music actually, is it still developing or is it, did it stop somewhere? I mean, that's just a question. I'm not saying I know. <laughs> I'm just saying like, did it, did that tradition kind of stop, you know? Um, maybe, probably not in some of the more isolated areas, but um, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's just an interesting phenomenon, the globalization and how that's affected um, music in that way. I think you're right. There's there's so much more cross pollination, and and certainly a lot of artists are are connected to many different styles. Although, I do still feel that composers from different parts of the world have a different kind of side. I think, you yeah. know, even with access to all of that, in a lot of cases, there's still some sense of of one surrounding. That's I I don't know. It, it is an interesting question though at this stage what folk music would mean because it used to be something that was just a way of carrying a musical tradition within a smaller community. And now that that's kind of opened up, how does that change that tradition? I didn't want to interrupt the discussion of folk music, but um, I wish that I had said something in support, maybe even in defense of the Woodwind Quintet, since we're editing, this goes back to the Woodwind Quintet. No, please. Um, it was, in many places, it was fashionable to disparage the woodwind quintet, that it because it was five different instruments and not as homogeneous as a string quartet. But um, the woodwind quintet is the core of the orchestra wind section. Learning to blend those colors and add something unique is certainly um, a challenge and uh, one of the most interesting aspects of playing a woodwind quintet. And uh, 
So I just wanted to say that I think the five different instruments thing is not a disadvantage. It's something for us to embrace. <laughs> and you represented amazingly. And, and I, did you have anything you wanted to add from outside? I wanted to just mention to viewers that you will find the actual holograph manuscript of this work, the Grand Partita, on our website. It's it'll be uh, easy to find if you. The quick way to get to it is just by typing "Musical Treasures Consortium," and then you find Grand Partita of Mozart. Um, you'll see his writing is, is you know, the, the title, not Grand Partita, it, it was not his title, it was added much later. But anyway, this is one of the many resources you can find. The library has owned this since 1941, and you can actually buy a facsimile copy too, one that was uh, sponsored, a reprint was of a facsimile that we made, was sponsored appropriately by the International Fan Masters Association. So I hope people might have a chance to look at that. Wonderful. I own that, that facsimile and it's a treasure. It's so amazing to see how neat his handwriting is and how there are just so few corrections to anything. Yes, that's great. Incredible. Great. Well, is there anything that anyone would like to say in closing? Um, you know, we're coming to the end of the, the hour. So is there anything that any of you would like to add before we close? I just want to say one more thank you to both of, to all of you from the Library of Congress for including the Met Orchestra musicians in your programming and to all of our players. Um, we had, um, I think, four different people fly in for this recording, actually, um, from as far as um, from um, Washington State and from South America and from all over. And, and this was really, for me, an inspiring thing to, to see our players come together in this way to perform, to hear you guys again um, was really wonderful, something that helped get me through this this year so thank you all yeah thank you thank you oh great thank you well thank well yeah thank you to all of you i just was just going to say um although there are currently no opera performances the met orchestra musicians have still been very busy and um i encourage our listeners to check out their website metorchestramusicians.org and to check out their various initiatives grants concerts and additional content highlighting the members of this amazing ensemble um, so I'd like to thank all of you, uh, Mark, Elaine, Julia, Eric, Nathan, and Dean, for taking the time to speak with Anne and I today. And, um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully in person. Thank you.